Hi, welcome to Managing Secrets in Code with HashiCorp Vault. I'm Josh Cork, and I'm going to be your speaker today. If you want, you can follow me on Twitter. I sometimes retweet things about HashiCorp Vault as well as other uh, DevOps and site reliability engineering type of things. Uh, if you're not into Twitter uh, and you want to collaborate, I'm also on GitHub with the same username and I contribute to quite a few open source projects. In this talk today, we are going to be talking about the fundamentals of HashiCorp Vault, what it is, a uh, high level view of how it works, uh, how a client can interact with HashiCorp Vault. After that, we're going to take a look at some risky code that has some secrets stored right in it. So we're going to try and fix that risky code uh, with HashiCorp Vault by putting the secrets there. And we'll also take a look at how we can implement a CICD pipeline using HashiCorp Vault as well. Full disclosure before we start, I do not work for HashiCorp Vault and I do not receive any funds from HashiCorp Vault for talking about the product here today. Uh, I've just used it in my own environment and it has done uh, great things for me and moving my company from uh, using secrets stored in plain text, pass, uh, plain text files uh, into uh, using a modern tool like this. So who am I? Well, I'm Josh Cork, like I said before, and I'm a senior systems engineer. Uh, currently on my team, I am one of the engineers that's responsible for uh, working on HashiCorp Vault. It's not the only thing that I do throughout the day, but I tend to spend a lot of time uh, helping other engineers as well as developers uh, look at how to implement ACLs and uh, policies uh, within HashiCorp Vault for all the different things that we are doing in our company. I get a lot of those questions because recently I actually went and got the HashiCorp Certified Vault Associate uh, Certification. Uh, this certification is something that HashiCorp put forward as a uh, measure of someone who knows at least the bare minimum uh, fundamentals of how HashiCorp works. Uh, it's a great exam. I would highly suggest it to anybody who's looking to know more about HashiCorp Vault because it, it pushes you to learn things that you might not experience. HashiCorp is both open source and enterprise. So uh, there's a lot of features out there that you probably wouldn't get into if you only use the open source version of HashiCorp Vault. Uh, beyond that, because of all of my experience at work and uh, getting uh, introduced to HashiCorp Vault, uh, I went ahead and I made a secret management extension, uh, which is for the PowerShell uh, secret management module, uh, which is a, a new feature that the PowerShell team has just uh, put out there, uh, whereby which they've kind of abstracted the ability to get secrets and set secrets um, from various backends. Uh, so people have made various uh, extensions, and uh, I'm the current maintainer of the HashiCorp version. Uh, I'm also uh, not terribly too good at golf, uh, so don't know how that's related to tech, but I, I can't always be uh, bragging or humble bragging about myself about how good I am. So uh, there's, there's, there's some of the, my flaws there. Before diving in to talk about HashiCorp Vault, uh, it's probably first good that we establish what exactly is a secret. And before that, we probably need to just ask, you know, what is important information? Well, ultimately, it depends. It depends on where you work. What is your industry? Uh, important information to finance might be how the stock market is handling. Uh, important information to retail might be, what is the weather like? Are we gonna have a rainy weekend? Does that impact people coming into our store? One common thing that we all have though are passwords and uh, other types of secrets that are related to authentication, such as API keys and encryption keys. So for the purposes of this talk, we're going to refer to secrets as being those kind of items. A lot of times when people start to uh, use secrets, though, we all need secrets to get information, to pass information in our code. So the early onset is usually just putting the secret directly into code. This is probably the easiest method and it's just getting the job done, right? I'll, I'll come back to this at a later point is usually what we tell ourselves. Um, and so maybe we'll advance a little bit and we'll pull that out of the code itself and we'll put it into an app config. So it's not in the code, but it's next to the code. And we might actually do this not for security purposes, but we may do this because of convenience. I have this app I want to deploy in multiple environments, but we have passwords in different environments. So I might just put it into app config rather than putting it somewhere else. 
We may even advance a little bit further, or if we're starting to look towards uh, Kubernetes and looking towards cloud native platforms, uh, we might start to think, oh, well, what if I just put it into the environment of where it's running? Maybe I'll just create an environment variable that exists inside of my container, and that will be where I put my secrets. Uh, that's still not great, but that's, uh, that's another place that you might put some secret information. You know, another place that you might start to look is saying like, well, are there any alternative auth methods? Maybe I can use a certificate that can do my authenticating for me rather than it being just a password. But that starts to get a little bit more tricky to, to figure out. It becomes a little bit more, uh, you know, difficult to use. Uh, and then finally, you might get to the other spectrum where you start to use something where you centrally store all of your secrets and you use... Um, zero trust to say, hey, anytime anybody's going to get something out of the secret store, you need to verify that you are who you say you are, you're the application that you say you are, uh, to get out this secret. So really, we have this spectrum of functionality versus security or usability uh, to uh, what some might say is unusable. Typically, people haven't wanted to implement these, uh, maybe things that are towards this right, right side of the screen, as much because it gets into complexity. If I, if I have to use a certificate to auth, then I have to think about generating that certificate all the time. And if I have to generate that certificate all the time, then it's just going to be messy to kind of keep this code up. But really, if you lower the barrier uh, to make that easier for people to uh, get a secret, to roll a secret, uh, then it, it really removes that burden. So enter in HashiCorp Vault. Uh, if we were looking at that previous screen, this would be towards the right end of that spectrum. Uh, some central system that you can use to uh, keep and roll secrets. Now, the beauty of HashiCorp Vault, it is very flexible. What we have here is they have uh, pretty much all of these authentication methods. Uh, the very base core of any authentication method that they use is something known as a token. You can then plug in all of these other kind of authentication methods, uh, maybe most popularly LDAP or RADIUS or Active Directory, uh, and then other things such as uh, Kubernetes, whereby which you have a Kubernetes cluster authenticating into Vault to get authorized in order to receive a secret. On the other side of this diagram, you then have very pluggable uh, methods of storing secrets. Uh, which HashiCorp refers to as engines. So you have uh, maybe your base layer key value engine where it's essentially just keys and values of data that are just stored in a flat file uh, in the database. Uh, or you have you know, something that's a little bit more complex like Azure, whereby which it might generate dynamic secrets for you. HashiCorp Vault also has this idea of policies so that you can actually lock down what authentication methods can do and what secret engines can be accessed. So the default for HashiCorp Vault is a denial. So if you don't have explicit permissions to it, then it's just going to assume that you're not allowed to access that. So how does HashiCorp Vault work? Well, it's made up of a couple components, and this is more or less a high-level view of how it works. So uh, in the center here, we have what's known as the barrier, and this is where all of the secrets are stored. Um, when the server is not running, there is, in, in fact, a storage backend that is encrypted at rest. So uh, whenever secrets get stored there, uh, there is no way that they can be recovered without encrypting or decrypting the uh, engine first. And then on the front end, everything goes through an HTTP, HTTPS API. Now, uh, if you have TLS configured for that with a certificate, of course, it is going to be encrypted uh, between the client and the host. Now, uh, we talked about the barrier as being where everything happens. Well, the barrier is made up of several different components. So you have the core engine here, and this basically handles all of the pathing. Every single thing inside of HashiCorp Vault is a path. Within the core engine, you have this path routing so that anytime it, it gets a, a, a path, it knows if it needs to go to the system backend or if it's the secret engine or if it's the auth method. Now, the barrier uh, is decrypted with the encryption key uh, when it is up and running. In order to get that encryption key that you're going to decrypt 
uh, your barrier with, uh, you need to have the master key. The interesting thing with HashiCorp Vault is they actually take uh, the master key and they use this algorithm known as Shamir's secret sharing. And what they do is they take the one uh, master key that they may have for unlocking the encryption key and they split it up into shards. So instead of having one master key, you actually can have three, five, seven, uh, multiple numbers of keys that are then uh, passed out to either team members or are uh, stored in separate locations. So that way, if you need to decrypt the vault after it's rebooted or it's been down for maintenance or you need to bring it back up into a, a DR environment, um, all of that can be done by not just one key, but sp spreading the load out. And oftentimes when you're, you're decrypting it in a production environment, you may have five keys that make up the master key, but you only need to use a portion of those. So usually three of the five. Once Vault is up and running, uh, you then have to worry about client authentication. The base level authentication method within Vault is called a token. Now a token has all sorts of information around it. Each token has a time to live, uh, if it can be renewed or not renewed, uh, if that token can access a specific place in Vault. Uh, sometimes uh, you can lock down specific tokens to only access one specific place inside a Vault. In a typical client authentication situation for accessing secrets in Vault, uh, you first have the client, whether it's an agent or the web UI or the API, and various clients, whichever they are, are going to go ahead and authenticate out to the API. Now, this is going to do this different ways. If you have a token, then it'll do the token method. If you're using something like user pass, which is just username and password, um, or app role, which is built into Vault, which we'll talk about later, um, or even LDAP or GitHub, whatever, whatever your authentication method is, you authenticate to the API, which then authorizes, is this person, is this token allowed to log in? And do you have the right policy? Are you allowed to access the secret you're trying to access? Or if your token has your token expired, uh, if you're using one of the, uh, authentication methods below, such as user path, app role, LDAP, GitHub. Uh, you're returned a token, which then you use to access secrets. Uh, if you're using a token, then whatever secret or thing you're trying to access uh, is returned directly to your client. Every time, every time you go to get a secret or you go to do something with Vault, it goes through this process of what token are you using? Are you authorized to use this token? And uh, are you allowed to get whatever you need to get? So basically it po pushes um, zero trust onto the client saying that we, we need to authorize and we need to validate who you are before we give you any of our secrets. All right, so we are gonna jump into some demos now. Uh, we are gonna take a look at a fake company called Cool Cat Lemonade. They are new to the Lemonade stand scenes in Nashville, Tennessee and they're trying to make some headway. They uh, got a little bit of a late start, but they're thinking that November is gonna be their month for uh, selling lemonade uh, at, at peak, peak season. Uh, unfortunately, to get their product out the door, they decided that they were going to uh, write their top secret algorithm and just start getting going on it, and that they would worry about secrets later. So in fact, they've embedded some secrets into their code. So we're going to try and reverse this code and uh, pull these secrets out. And demo zero, uh, the problem. So here we are, uh, we are on weatherstack.com. Uh, one of the developers found that this was a great place for getting weather information. And uh, they decided that, hey, if it's good enough for all these other companies, we might as well use it too. And it even says that it's free. So let's take a look at their documentation and see what it takes to use their API. All right, so uh, the weather forecast, that's what we want. That's our secret, top secret uh, algorithm. Uh, we're just looking at what tomorrow's weather is gonna be like. All you need is an access key and everything is uh, URL parameters. So you don't have to send any posts or rests or anything like that. You can just query the URL and get your data. 
All right, so let's go ahead and we're gonna click sign up here for an API account. Uh, and looks like we're gonna go with free here so that we can get going fast with this project. Now I'm not gonna sign this out here on, on this screen share, but uh, we'll go ahead and take care of that. So gone ahead and signed up for the free account and uh, here's our risky forecast code. So we're first off, since the API is using parameters, uh, we basically have to build out our, our parameter uh, query string. So we've just decided to put our API key directly here in this code, uh, which has actually been pushed up to GitHub and has been leaked out to the internet. So now everybody in the world has our API key. Not great. Another thing that's not great about this demo, and I can't really help it here because we're using the free API, but uh, everything is going over HTTP. So if we were really wanting to make this robust, we would fix this as well by paying for a subscription. Finally, after getting all this stuff together, we're just gonna invoke the rest method and get our data back. So here we are, we're gonna execute our code and uh, hopefully we will get back our business critical information for tomorrow. And it looks like tomorrow is going to be very cold in Nashville. So I don't think Cool Cat Lemonade is going to have a good day of sales tomorrow. So another idea that you might think of to, to kind of mitigate this risky code is trying to do something like this. If you're familiar with PowerShell, maybe you could just pass in a parameter. It's not in the code. We're just passing it to the code at runtime. And this is a great idea, uh, but it also falls short a little bit, especially if you're doing it as a plain string, because inside of windows uh, whenever powershell is executed if you have script block logging turned on the entirety of this script block is recorded into the event viewer which means that just as if you were saving your secrets inside this code it's now saved inside your event log so now if you can see this uh, it is right there in plain text just as it would have been if we had stored it inside of our source code All right, so now we're gonna try and get through our solution. How are we gonna fix this problem? Well, for this demo, we're gonna to need to spin up a instance of HashiCorp Vault. Uh, and I've gone ahead and done that with this Docker Compose file, which spins up a HashiCorp Vault instance uh, on my local laptop for development testing, and also then configures some bootstraps for us. So this is not what you should do for your production installation. This is just for our developers to get comfortable with Vault and to figure out a solution. As you can see, there's only one unseal key here, which uh, if this was a production instance, it would have multiple keys. And also our root token is Automation Summit 2021. So not very secure. We've also gone ahead and created a user pass account to log in. So if we go back to our browser, we can go ahead and navigate over to uh, localhost, or uh, 127.0.0.1 uh, colon 8200, which is the port that uh, Vault uses. And uh, as you can see, this is the web UI, uh, which is on this instance by default. Uh, you can see it is unsealed. Uh, even without authenticating, you can get back the status of Vault. Is it sealed or unsealed? Sealed means you cannot get any secrets out of the Vault. So we would need to uh, get that out first. Now we're gonna log in with a token first. We're gonna log in with the root token. The root token is special in that it is created at uh, initialization of HashiCorp Vault and it is not meant to stick around for long. In fact, uh, HashiCorp suggests that you actually revoke it once you've set up your LDAP or your GitHub or whatever other authentication methods you're gonna use. So once we're logged in, we see two different secret engines. The first one is Cubbyhole, which is a temporary scratch space that's per token or per login. Uh, next, we have this one called secret, and this is a key value uh, engine. There's nothing currently here. We look at configuration, we can find a little bit more information about this engine, uh, such as uh, information about the lease. If we needed to create a new one, uh, we can just create a new one from here. You can see there's a lot of different engines, such as Active Directory, EKI certificates. We're gonna click KV here. And you can name this whatever you wanna name it, uh, there are different versions. Uh, the defaults to version two now, which gives us metadata about the uh, secrets within the vault. Uh, the next tab over here is actually access. So if you set up multiple authentication methods, you can see them here. We went ahead and set up user pass in our Docker Compose. 
We have this account called CoolCat for our developer. And uh, this gives us our generic information about CoolCat. Uh, we haven't configured anything, so it's the defaults, which are uh, very open. Uh, the generated token policy, so any tokens that are generated from this login are going to get the secret policy. We click over here, we can see that there's the default ACL policy. And this allows uh, any token to basically look itself up or to renew itself or to revoke itself uh, whenever it's logged in. Uh, next, we have the secret, which is the specific ACL policy we created. So as you can see, there's a path uh, for the ACL, and then there's a capabilities. And the capabilities are usually in the sense of create, read, update, delete, uh, and then there's even list and sudo. Uh, we've specifically said that this user or this policy can create the API key, but it can't create any other secret. The final policy here is the root policy, and this cannot be edited or deleted, and it is used by this root token. Uh, and it should be used very carefully since it explicitly gives access to everything. If we go back to secrets, uh, no, actually one other thing I wanted to show you was that uh, there is a cool client right here in the web browser that you can use uh, where you can actually uh, use the vault command line tool from the web browser, which I always thought was a, a cool trick. Um, we're not gonna use that for most of our demos, but I figured it was worth pointing out since it is a button to click. Oh, let's go ahead and sign out. Now we're going to actually log in with our cool cat account. Once we're in with the cool cat account, we can actually see that we do not have that policies tab. Uh, and even if we click on access, we cannot see anything about the other authentication methods. So going back to secrets, uh, let's go see if we can actually create a secret from the web UI. Uh, if we want to create a secret, we basically need to give it a path. So it's going to be something and we can put in as many key values as we need to here. We click save. We actually get a permission denied. And the reason we get a permission denied is because our previous policy for the secret, which was applied to this account, only allowed us to create the API key. So what clients do we need? Well, uh, there are several different clients we can use. First one that you can download and install is the Vault client. Now the Vault client is the same compiled binary that you can actually use for the server and also for the agent. It's written in Go, Go Lang and it's uh, uh, cross compiled. So it's basically the same binary that you can use on multiple systems. So we're just gonna download 64. Next is JQ. Uh, for most of you who may have used PowerShell before, you're maybe comfortable with convert from JSON, convert to JSON. JQ is essentially a cross-platform tool that we can use as well uh, to convert uh, JSON into uh, string data. Now, anytime I download an open source binary or from an open source project, I usually try to compare the SHA of the binary with one with the SHA that they have provided. The final tool here is uh, PowerShell. Uh, secret management, uh, which this is the PowerShell module I was talking about earlier that the PowerShell team has created that uses various extensions to abstract away how to get secrets. So there's one for key pass, last pass, and then here's the one for HashiCorp key value. So uh, we're going to use that later on as well. So first off, let's just use the good old vault binary to uh, log in and look around. Uh, the vault binary is very helpful here in that it provides uh, help built into the command. Uh, so if you don't know where something's at, you can easily uh, hunt around for it here. Uh, I think we're going to need to log in uh, and we might need to do a read or write, but let's look at login first to see if there's any helpful information here. So if we do dash H, we actually get all of this glorious information about how to use vault login. Thankfully, they have a demo here for us. So we're gonna use our user pass, the CoolCat account, to actually log in here to our Vault instance. Now, I don't see anything here about an address. So how do I tell it where I wanna log into, right? Um, 
there should be some information about that. So let's scroll down here. Ah, uh, yes, and here we go. So there is a dash address parameter. Uh, by default, it uses HTTPS 127.0.0.1. But since we're not doing HTTPS and HTTP, we're going to need to uh, assign that vault adder uh, environment variable. So let's go ahead and assign that variable. And a lot of the other configuration that can be used with Vault can also be configured this way. If you create an environment variable for your token, uh, for uh, other various things, you can put that into an environment variable. So now that we've done that, now we should be able to do Vault login. And the method is going to be user pass. The default method is a token. Um, so if you don't put any of this in, uh, you'll just put in a token. And then our username that we're going to log in with. Uh, now it's asking us for a password for CoolCat. We'll type that in. And as part of logging in, now we have a token. So we do not need to do vault login ever again. We're just going to need to use this token that's been generated for us. Now this token has a rather long lifespan. Um, this can be tuned and this should be tuned to be shorter for whatever your use case is. Uh, you can also see that it is a renewable token and that it has these various policies assigned to it. So we need to put our API key into Vault. So to do that, I'm going to do this read host. And I'm using PowerShell for all of these demos. So uh, if you're not familiar with read host, uh, it is a command that just reads from the host. And I'm doing that for the purposes of not having that API token in my history at all, which is a good practice. Now that we have our API key stored into that variable, we can go ahead and check to see if, we've, if we have a secret out there yet in the API key uh, path. So if we do kv get, that's going to be key value get and then the path. And it doesn't find it there. So we're going to go ahead and put it out there. So the syntax for this is going to be vault kv put and then our path for our secret. We do need to provide the key value pair. So it will be whatever the key is. So we're going to call it token is equal to whatever our value is. And that's going to be our API key. Now, once that is put there, we actually get this metadata about it. So when was it created and uh, what version is it? We'll come back to the version here in a second. Now, if we do a get, we will actually get the metadata and also then the data of the secret. Now, if you want to just get the data out and not have all of that other information, uh, there is a method by which you can do this with the, not, with the native agent. Uh, and that is going to be formatting the secret out in a specific format. Uh, typically, this is done in JSON, which puts it into a very familiar format here. So as you can see, uh, it's all out in JSON, and you can see the different layers of data. Now, if we wanted to pull back a specific value we could do if you're familiar with PowerShell convert from JSON which takes that JSON object and puts it into a PS custom object now unfortunately we can't see our token that's what we want to get out of this and we would have to circle that and do dot sourcing but if we were wanting to use the native vault uh, agent we can then pipe that to JQ uh, which is that uh, app we looked at earlier and just do dot data data to get down into the token we could even do dot token to just get the, the value itself. So the next thing we're going to look at is actually the secret, um, secret management module. So we didn't see any registered secret vaults. So now we're actually going to register our secret management HashiCorp vault extension. We need to give it the name of the vault. And in this case, it needs to match the name of the engine inside of uh, vault. Uh, to register, we also need a, a few more data points. We need to know what the vault server name is. So in this case, it's going to be our local host uh, on 8200. And then we also need to tell this module what the auth type is so that it knows how to authenticate or what endpoint to go against. So we're going to say it's user path. 
Uh, the description here is just for the uh, secret management uh, within PowerShell here, and then we can make it our default vault so that uh, we don't use anything else. Also for this uh, example, I'm gonna turn the warning preference on to silently continue since our user account doesn't really have a lot of access and there are some warnings that get printed since this, this vault module will actually test a few things. We still have our API key in our variable and we're gonna go ahead and see if we can get any secret info. Because I haven't logged in to get a token, I have to log in now. And now I see that there is API key, which we put in there with the vault token or with the vault um, agent. Now we're able to get that secret and we can actually return it as plain text. And then if we needed to go set it again, we could uh, set it with dash name dash secret. And uh, it takes it in as a hash table here uh, so that it kind of keeps that key value uh, nature of this. So there we go, we have our secret still there. Now, I've put that secret in there twice. If we go back to the web client and look at this secret from this perspective, uh, you can see that, hey, we've got the API key there. But if you notice, we now actually have two versions of that secret. And this is one of the benefits of using the uh, key value version two instance. Uh, we can go ahead and delete this secret and it's gone. We can then recover it if we're an admin, uh, that has the permissions to do so, um, or uh, we can um, permanently delete it so that it's no longer even shows up here as a version. Now we're gonna go back to version one really quick here and we can create a new version from this, um, which would override and make it version three that's now available to us. So we'll go do that. You can add any values, any extra key values you need. There's a warning that we're gonna be making a new version from version one. And now we have three versions here. And so it's as, as easy as that to, to roll a secret um, inside of HashiCorp Vault if you need to. So now with those modifications being made, we now have an updated, less risky forecast script for our company. Uh, instead of putting the, the secret in there, we're gonna actually be using that get secret to pull it out. We could also just use the vault kv uh, get function too but we're gonna go with the PowerShell since we are running a PowerShell script. So it's gonna ask us for our username and password since we don't have a token yet. So we're gonna authenticate and now we've got some verbosity to see what's actually going on. So it's, it's connecting to the vault instance, it's giving us some warnings, it's getting the secrets and then it's returning it. And now we have the forecast again. Nothing's changed, still a bad day to sell lemonade, but uh, the good news is, is that our secret is now no longer out there in plain text. And even more importantly, it would not be uh, recorded here in this log either. All right, so for our final demo, we are going to look at combining an app role with Jenkins. So here we are again, um, we've actually spun up a new instance of vaults and put the secret back there. And in this instance, we've also spun up a Jenkins instance, which has been kind of pre-configured with some of the things that we need. It already has a job set up for us to run our daily forecast check. And uh, we've gone ahead and also bootstrapped in a couple plugins. Uh, the two that I've specifically put in here is actually the HashiCorp vault plugin and also the PowerShell plugin. Now to configure the HashiCorp Vault plugin on Jenkins here, uh, we're gonna go ahead and log in to uh, configure this job. Now in a production environment of Jenkins, uh, I would expect everything to be locked down. And that's gonna be a crucial thing is, is in managing Jenkins here, is making sure that only people who can have access to this do have access. So for our job here, we're just simply doing a uh, running of the script and that script doesn't have anything more than an environment variable. Because of the nature of Jenkins and the, the way that jobs are created and destroyed quickly, uh, there's not necessarily a concern of putting that in there. Now, when we spun this up, we created a thing called an app role. And app roles are designed to be for machines to authenticate into Vault rather than users. So we created the app role, we created a policy for the app role, and then for the app role here, we've actually designated what IPs can be used to use the secret ID, what 
uh, number of times it can be used. And then once it gets a token, how can that token be used? What IPs can it be used from, et cetera? So we're gonna log in here now with the root token so that we can take a look at this. Um, if you were an admin, you would configure the production version of this to not have the root token, but rather to have admins that have access to look at app roles. Next, um, we're gonna take a look at the app role itself, which we've created under this path of auth app role role Jenkins. And like we were looking at before in the policy, uh, it has all of the definitions there of what it's allowed to do. If we wanna see the role ID, which you could think of as a username, uh, this is the role ID. You can also make that a friendly role ID name or a custom role ID name. Next, we're gonna need to get a secret ID. Now, there are other ways of getting the secret ID to the client, but for right now, we're just gonna force out a secret ID to the screen here. This is the only time you'll see it, but you can see there's the secret ID, the accessor ID, and the time to live. The secret ID is actually the secret. The accessor is what you can reference that from afterwards if you need to delete it or clean it up. Now here, we're gonna check the Vault plugin and we're gonna put in our URL, which is just Vault inside of uh, Docker. Uh, we are gonna add a credential here, specifically an app role credential. We're gonna put our role ID in there and our secret ID. And then we're gonna just put in a, a friendly description. The ID you can leave blank because that's generated by Jenkins and the namespace uh, is gonna be left blank in this case as well. Now that we've put that credential in there, we can use it in our job here. And the next thing we're gonna do is make sure that we're using uh, key value version two. If you needed to skip SSL verification, you could, but we do not need to do that since we're using HTTP. And now we put in the path to our secret. So our secret is at secret API key. And the key name that we're pulling out is token. You can make a custom environment variable if you need to, but that won't need to be necessary. So we have our URL. Our app role is going to authenticate, get us a token, and then that token is going to be used to look up these secrets. And then that secret is going to be an environment variable used by that script. So now we can save that and go ahead and build our job. So that built pretty fast. So now we can go ahead and check this and we can in fact see that the current temperature there is still cold in Nashville, Tennessee today. So it does not look like we will be getting any lemonade sales for our company, but we have the peace of mind that our secrets are safe. So just as an example, to kind of show you a little bit more about what's going on with the secret or with the role ID and the secret ID, I figured I would do this example here of logging into Vault uh, using both of those. Now, when you log in with an app role, uh, you're actually writing to the login page, uh, which kind of seems a little weird, um, but it is the idea of, of writing uh, a secret to get a token. So now we have our token back, which has constraints around it, right? It only lists for one hour to access that specific app role data. It can't access any other data in the engine. We can do a vault token lookup, which will tell us more about it. Uh, it'll show us what ciders it's bound to, when the issue time was, if it's renewable. Uh, very important information to know. And if we needed to renew that token, we totally can do that. You know, it's just as easy as vault token renew. And then if we look it up again, we should see that the last renewal timestamp has been incremented and it does uh, give us more information there. Now, if that token for whatever reason is bad and we needed to clear it out, we can go ahead and use the revoke method to revoke it. And then if we try to look it up again, uh, we may actually get an error as that token no longer exists. So after a few hours of this job running, the constraints eventually ran out where uh, the app role was no longer able to function. So this is somewhat good in that you're only leasing out your secrets for a very specific amount of time. I hope you found those last few demos uh, helpful in getting an insight into how HashiCorp Vault works and uh, getting to see how it integrates with other systems like Jenkins. Now, I did promise that it was gonna be a CICD pipeline example, but it was just not working out for me. So I went with the simpler job methodology there. Although I can attest that it does fully work with uh, CICD workflows inside of Jenkins. And the syntax is a little bit different, but pipeline, declarative pipeline jobs in Jenkins do handle the secrets really well. 
So the benefits of using Vault is that you get to really keep your secrets abstracted away. You get to pull it out of your code. Uh, all you need to know is a path to where your secret resides. Uh, if at any point in the future you have a secret that is um, compromised or is out there on GitHub somewhere, uh, you can easily switch it out. You can roll it, you know. Even if a developer leaves, you can roll those secrets over uh, as frequently as you're required to. Uh, it's also great that Vault requires verification for every access. So anytime somebody's looking to pull a secret, uh, it is something that is uh, required to be authorized. Vault is really great too because of the flexibility you have. You have, uh, we only looked at two authentication engines and one secrets engine. Uh, but there are a host of other ones that are available. Uh, setting up LDAP is really easy. So if you're in an Active Directory environment, it's really easy to set it up so that your team can log in with their AD creds to access secrets. Thanks again for um, coming into my talk today. I really hope that it did help you at least understand a little bit more about HashiCorp Vault. Uh, and made, maybe made you think more about your own uh, code that you have out there in your environment and maybe improvements that you can make. Even if it's not jumping fully on board with this, uh, even incremental in, uh, changes are great uh, for every environment. So I want to say thanks again to the DevOps Collective for uh, accepting me to be a speaker for this conference. Uh, if you found what I shared interesting or you want to talk with me more, please feel free to connect with me on Twitter or collaborate with me on GitHub. Have a great rest of the conference.